Good afternoon, everyone. Well, my neighbor across the street finally brought the horses. I've been out of the horse business for a number of years now, but I decided that he asked me if we could he could use our pasture. So uh, this week he brought a trailer over and unloaded three horses at first and then finally the other one. So we have four horses that we get to watch, but we don't have to take care of. So we're enjoying them, and they're a lot of fun. They're not as tame as the ones that I had, so it's going to be a lot of fun to to get to know those horses and uh, get them used to human contact. And uh, and I was out there this morning looking at them and just admiring. I was thinking, looking at that horse, you know, they have ears and they're very alert. And they got great big old eyes. Judy said, can they see at night? And I said, yeah, they have great big old eyes. You know, they can go out and walk across the pasture and graze at night. And, and uh, But the thing about horses is they know more about you than you know about yourself they can pick up on all kinds of emotions and uh, it's funny to look at them and see they they sort of have a natural smile too have you ever looked at a horse their horse their 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 smile sort of turns up their mouth sort of turns up and i thought you know if that's not enough proof right there i mean why does the horse have he's got two eyes just like we do he's got nostrils he's got a mouth he's got ears just like human beings do i mean the Evidence is there that God exists, that he created those animals, and what a majestic creature they are. They're marvelous to look at and to watch, see them run and jump and buck. And, and uh, this man, is uh, he raises horses, and he's bred those four that we have, or three of them that are mares, that are, and I just cannot wait till they drop some foals on the ground and we get to watch those again. I, I have fond memories of the ones that I had, and I can't wait. Do we have zeal? Are we a church that has zeal? You might ask, well, what is zeal anyway? When I think of the word zeal, an image pops into my mind. I can't help it. I have the image of some guy standing there with a smile on his face and a gold tooth and the sunlight's hitting that gold tooth. And it, For some reason, that image always pops in my mind when I hear the word zeal. Maybe it's a salesman that is always smiling and he's got that image of the glistening teeth there. The word zeal means eager or ardent interest in a pursuit of something. Fervor, enthusiasm, passion. We have, we're passionate about a lot of things. Some people collect things. They have, they're passionate about cars. They're passionate about objects that they collect artwork i saw one of these hideous looking paintings that went on the market up in new york here a couple of months ago that went for something like 150 to 200 million dollars i mean it was something it looked like something that you would see graffitied on the side of a railroad car and i thought that's art that's what we're spending hundreds of millions of dollars for Some people are passionate or enthusiastic about hobbies, about actors. They'll read and do research and try to get their picture taken with an actor or a singer or a band, maybe. I've seen concerts where some of these bands have had people that absolutely are fanatics, just hundreds, tens of thousands of people in the crowd, jumping up and down simultaneously, shaking the whole building enthusiastic about that rock band or that popular youth band or whatever it might be and sports teams now you want to talk about enthusiasm go down here and watch a dallas cowboy football game or a green bay packer football game and look at the crowd and see how enthusiastic those people are that is enthusiasm now what about enthusiasm for the work of God and the church of God and the commission that we've been given to do. As I said in the beginning, do we have zeal? Is it time to quit? Is it time to give up? Is it time to lay down our calling? Is it kind of growing old, growing cold? Should we, on the other hand, be on fire, zealous of good works, as Paul said in the book of Titus? You know, Paul was someone who was extremely zealous. Misplaced at times, though, I should say. 
You remember, he was so zealous that he was the cause of some of the first martyrs who were Christians. He was so zealous of the law and what he had been taught in his upbringing. I mean, he went all the way to Antioch chasing these Christians down and hurt, you know, dragging them back to Jerusalem and have them killed. That's how zealous he was. As I said, misguided. But then in Acts, the ninth chapter, when he was on his way to perpetrate one of these acts of capturing some of these, one of these rotten Christians, he heard an enormous voice that said, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Blinded him there on the road to Damascus. And for three days he did not eat or drink water. And God instructed a Christian man named Ananias to go and tell this man Saul that I have a work for him to do. And Ananias said, I've heard about this guy. He's the guy that carries Christians down to Jerusalem and has them killed. And God said, don't worry. I have chosen this vessel for my work. And it tells us in Acts the ninth chapter, And Ananias went his way and entered the house and putting his hands on him and said, Brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus that appeared unto you in the way that you came, has sent me that you might receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately there fell from his eyes that had been scales and he received sight forthwith and arose and was baptized. How long did it take Saul to be baptized, to be converted? About that long. When he was stricken down by this great powerful voice and this enormous light. And what did Paul, who, was later, who would later be called Paul, what was the first thing that he did? We'll look in the next verses. And he'd, re, he'd received meat and was strengthened. Then was Saul certain days with the disciples that were at Damascus. And straightway... He preached Christ in the synagogue that he is the Son of God. Immediately, Paul went to work. This was his first declaration here. This was his very first true ministry for Jesus Christ. And what was the result? We'll look down at verse 22. And Paul increased more in strength and confounded the Jews which dwelled at Damascus, proving that this is the very Christ. And what did the Jews do? And after many days were fulfilled, the Jews took counsel to kill him. They must have thought, this guy's a traitor. He was on our side. Now all of a sudden he's preaching this Christ business. And so they took counsel to kill him. And, they laying await was, and, and their laying await was known of Saul. And they watched the gates day and night to kill him. And then the disciples took him by night and let him down by the wall in a basket. He had to escape for his life. And you know the story there, how he, how he got away. And as I said, Paul's ministry began on this very day. In Acts the 13th chapter, we skip ahead a little bit here in the 13th chapter on Paul's first missionary journey, as it's called. Paul took his journey from Jerusalem. It, and uh, it tells us down in verse 2 that they fasted and uh, and. And the Holy Spirit said, separate me and me, Barnabas, and Saul for the work wherein we are called. We know that Paul left the mainland there in Syria where Antioch of Syria was. Now there are two, two Antiochs, or maybe even three, but one was in Syria there up by Caesarea where Paul left. Where the church there at Antioch was where Christians were first named. That was where they were first called Christians. And they sailed to the little island of Cyprus there, or I should say the big island of Cyprus. You remember the story that uh, they met the sorcerer named Bar-Jesus, the Jew, and Paul had to cast that demonic, or he struck him down with blindness, if you'll remember. And from there, they sailed from there up to the mainland of Turkey, which was known at that time as, as Pamphylia. And at that place where he landed, he migrated from there up to Antioch, the other Antioch, which was in Pisidia. And I'd like to go over to Acts 13 chapter down in, and of course, Paul, when he got there to Antioch, he gave this, you know, he gave the people there, he went into the synagogue, he sat down, and, the, and they read the law, and they had their 
scrolls that they read every Sabbath day. It tells us down in verse 14. And then he said, after you, the reading of the law and the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue, sent of them, saying, you men and brethren, if you have any word of exhortation for the people, say on. So they gave Paul and his visitors that were with him a chance to stand up and speak. Paul stood up, gave a fabulous speech here. You can read throughout this whole testimony here about Jesus Christ, who he was, the history of the nation of Israel, and how Jesus came to be the recipient or the very pinnacle of the story of Israel. I'd like to skip down to verse 42. He says, well, in verse 26, Men and brethren, children of the stock of Abraham, and whosoever among you fears God, to you is the word of this salvation sent. And for they that dwell in Jerusalem and their rulers, because they knew him not, nor yet the voice of the prophets, which are read every Sabbath day, they have fulfilled them in condemning him. And of course, he went on to tell them the story of how Jesus was crucified and that he was the Messiah that was to come. Down in verse 42, And when the Jews were gone out of the synagogue, the Gentiles besought that these words might be preached to them the next Sabbath day. Now when the congregation was broken up, many of the Jews and religious proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas, who speaking to them persuaded them to continue in the grace of God. This is a, this is a evangelistic tour, if you will. Paul is going from the island of Cyprus. Now you think, you, you just read through these words. Paul got in a ship there at Caesarea, sailed all the way to Cyprus, spent some time there, then sailed all the way to the coast of Turkey, then went up into the mainland there to, to this city and he's here preaching now and notice what it says and the next Sabbath day came almost the whole city together to hear the word of God so God's word is beginning to take some traction now Paul is there preaching this sermon and the whole city can you imagine going into a little town and going into some little church and, and being invited to speak. And the next week you're invited back and you come back and the whole, congr- the whole city's there. They're all the way out the back door and out in the street listening to this man who once condemned Christianity, now standing up in defense of it. And of course giving them the story of Jesus Christ. He tells us down in uh, verse 50, but the Jews stirred up the devout and honorable women and the chief men of the city and raised persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them out of their coast. Everywhere he went, it seems, when Paul would get up and preach, there was opposition at every corner. Over in Acts, the 14th chapter, we know that he left there and went to several cities in Asia Minor there. One of them was Iconium which we read about right here in the very next chapter uh, where he preached in the synagogue to the Jews and it says the Jews and, uh, and also of the Greeks believed. Down in verse 5, and when they were assault, when there was an assault made both of the Gentiles and also of the Jews, their rulers, to use them despitefully and to stone them, they wanted to take Paul out right then and probably beat him half to death and stone him. And, of course, when they got word of it, it says they made their way on to Lystra, which was the next little town. And uh, that begins down in verse uh, verse 8. And there said a certain man at Lystra, uh, impotent in his feet, being a cripple from his mother's womb, who never had walked. And the same heard Paul speak, who steadfastly beholding him and perceived that he had faith to be healed, said with a loud voice, Stand upright on your feet, and he leaped and walked. So, so Paul here performed a fantastic miracle, and this man was healed. And, of course, the, those, pity, those people of Lystra there called, uh, began to call them gods. They called them Zeus or Jupiter, uh, Actually, the Bible here says Hermes and Mercurius, but uh, they called Paul Zeus and Barnabas, I believe they called Jupiter there. And, uh, and of course, Paul dispelled that. He said, we're not gods, we're just men like you are. Uh, And then he went on to preach to them. Uh, But it tells us down later in that chapter there, I want to read, skipping ahead here, um, that we're men of like passions, down in verse 17. Nevertheless, we left none himself without witness, and that he did good and gave us rain from heaven and fruitful season, filling our hearts with food and gladness. And with these 
sayings, scarce restrained they the people that they had not done sacrifice unto them. And there came thither certain Jews from Antioch and Iconium. Now these are the cities that he had just left. The Jews followed him here. And having and persuade, who persuaded the people and having stoned Paul, drew him out of the city supposing he had been dead. So here Paul is stoned and I guess within an inch of his life, they thought he was actually dead. They drug him out and threw him on the garbage heap out there somewhere. And I guess some of these people that were with him and so some of those that were converted went out there, mended to his wounds, wiped his head with a cold cloth, revived him, gave him something to eat and drink, and he went on his way. And of course, it says that he went on to Lystra from there. Down in verse 22, confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith. I guess that's a little bit about what this sermon is about. Exhorting them to continue in the faith. And that we must, through much tribulation, enter into the kingdom of God. That was Paul's exhortation to those people. And when they had ordained them elders in every church and had prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord on whom they believed. That's Acts the 14th chapter down in verse 23. We know that the next series of uh, verses or chapters here is the Jerusalem conference where Paul went back to Jerusalem after this very short missionary journey. You know, they say Paul had went on four missionary journeys. Actually, he only went on three. The fourth one, he was in chains. It wasn't by choice, was it? Even though it was a missionary journey, he eventually ended up in Rome, didn't he? This was the end of the first missionary journey. And after this, he went back to the Jerusalem conference where the subject of circumcision had, come, had, ar had arisen. Paul, Peter, Barnabas, and James were the main pers uh, participants there in that conversation where they brought up the conversion of Cornelius which Peter said that, you know, and Paul both exclaimed that this man had been saved not through the law, which the Jews had, had been adamant that you had to keep the law perfectly in order to be saved. They brought up the evidence that Cornelius had received God's Holy Spirit and he'd never been a Jew. He had never kept God's law. He had never been circumcised. And of course, that was the whole reason for this Jerusalem conference. In fact, they said to the Jews, that they too would, through faith, have to be saved through Jesus Christ, that they couldn't reject Jesus Christ themselves, that he would have to be a part of their, their salvation. Acts the 15th chapter, down in verse 19, we know here that James said, Wherefore my sentence is, that to trouble them not, which were from among the Gentiles, or turn to God, but that we write unto them that they abstain from pollution of idols and fornication and from things strangled and from blood. I don't know how people get around this today. You go and people will make all kinds of food where they use fat and blood and all these other unclean animals that God's word absolutely tells us that we're to avoid. And here, after the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, they're teaching Gentile nations to abstain from blood. Because God said the life is in the blood and you're not to eat the blood. And here are these disciples and apostles here are preaching these Gentile nations to do exactly that. And for, for Moses of old time hath in every city them that preach him being read in the synagogues every Sabbath day. James, the brother of Jesus, who was probably in charge here of the church in Jerusalem, is giving this edict or is telling, instructing them to write a letter to all of these Gentile nations because, and he's giving them some basic guidelines here, four things that they're to do. And the rest, he says, they will learn when they read the law that is being read in the synagogue on the Sabbath day, every Sabbath day. Amazing story, amazing revelation. This pleased the apostles and the elders. They wrote this letter, and this is the letter that's actually down in beginning in verse 23 that, that tells us exactly what was written in that letter that Paul and Barnabas and others would send and carry to these. But I wanted to skip down. Verse 25, it seemed good to us being assembled with one accord to send chosen men unto you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul, men that have hazarded 
their own lives for the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. That means a lot to me when I read that scripture. I think about some of those men, young, 22, 23, some of them 18, 19 year old soldiers who are buried there at Normandy Beach. Young men that have lost their lives so that we might have the freedom to come here and assemble today, who never had a life, who got out of high school and stepped off the boat and were killed immediately. They never even saw the war, but they were there in defense of our country. And there were hundreds of them down through history who gave up their lives. But there were also men who gave up their lives and their fortunes for the work of God. And Paul was one of those. And they even mention this here, that they had hazarded their lives. Here Paul was actually recovering from being stoned to death. And I find that really fascinating that they mention that. Um, and, and of course, began then shortly thereafter Paul's second missionary journey. And I'd like to skip over there to Acts, the 16th chapter where they return. Now, this is probably about 40, between 40 to 49 AD that this second missionary journey took place. They returned to Iconium. Paul said, let's go back to those churches where we established. You know, those churches in Asia, we want to go see how they're doing. So he returned uh, to Iconium, Lystra, Derby, and checked to, check, to check their progress. From there, he crossed the Aegean Sea into what is known as Philippi which he met, remember he met the lady Lydia there, uh, and, and of course he met Timothy there as well. And down in verse uh, 16, chapter 16, verse 16, um, and it came to pass as he went to pray a certain damsel possessed with a spirit of divination met us, which brought her masters much gain by soothsaying. The same followed Paul and us and cried saying, these men are servants of the most high God, which show us, Show unto us the way of salvation. Interesting that a lady who is probably possessed of a demon here, she's crying out saying, these men are servants of the Most High God. Remember on one occasion when Jesus was encountered someone who was possessed with a demon and he would cast them out and they would come out and, and, and oftentimes they would say, thou art the Christ, the Son of God. And he would have to tell them not to use those words. He would have to command them, don't use those words. Don't reveal who I am. It's, it's, it's amazing to me that these, these demonic spirits know exactly who Jesus Christ is and why they scream this out. I don't understand that unless they're trying to be deceptive to try to take away focus from the real Jesus Christ, but they recognized these men as servants of the Most High God. And this did, this did she many days, but Paul, being grieved, turned and said to the Spirit, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her, and he came out that same hour. And when her master saw that their hope of gains was gone, they caught Paul and Silas and drew them in the marketplace and the rulers and brought them to the magistrates, these men being Jews exceedingly trouble our city, and teach customs which are not lawful for us to receive, neither to observe, being Romans. And the multitude rose up together against them, and the magistrates rent off their clothes, and they commanded to beat them. And when they had laid many stripes on them, they cast them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safe. Here, Paul and Barnabas, beaten again with an inch of their life. They say that they were only they could only be whipped 39 by 39 stripes they couldn't go beyond the 40 mark so they would slash you know they would whip them I'd, I'd hate to be slashed two or three times I remember in school the old coach would get us you know when we'd be goofing off or acting up not paying attention and he'd give us about three swats and I guarantee you he had your attention then now here we see the apostle Paul who was probably beaten with a leather strap 39 times he was laying over there in the cell bleeding. And what were they doing? And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoner heard them. And what effect did that have on this prisoner? He absolutely became converted, and he, he uh, 
fell down before them and, and it says they brought him out and said, Sirs, what must we do to be saved? And he said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved in your house. And, the, and they spake unto him the word of the Lord and all that were in the house. And he took the same, that the hour of the night, and washed their stripes and was baptized, he and all of his all of his straightway. And when he had brought them into the house, he set meat before them and rejoiced, believing in God. An amazing story there, how this jailer was converted. Can you imagine the story he told his grandkids? I'll tell you, the guy was in prison there, and there, there came this earthquake. The gates of the prison were open, and this man that had been beaten came out, and, and, uh, and I thought I was going to lose my life. Instead, I found life. I found salvation through this man that was there what an amazing story in acts the 17th chapter this is when paul went to thessalonica um i'd like to just skip ahead here it says paul as his manner was down in verse 2 went in unto them three sabbath days and reasoned with them out of the scriptures opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead, and that this Jesus, who I am preached unto you, is Christ. Some of these people had never heard this. And here this man was telling them, this one that those in Jerusalem killed was the Christ, the Messiah. And notice what happened to the Jews. But the Jews which believed not, down in verse 5, moved with envy, took unto them certain lewd fellows of a baser sort. It's amazing, over and over again, these people don't have the guts to do it themselves. They go out and hire these baser sort of fellows and gathered a company and set all the city in uproar and assault the house of Jason and, and, and sought to bring them out to the people. And when they had found them not, they drew Jason and certain brethren under the rulers of the city, saying, crying, these that have turned the world upside down or come hither also. <laughs> Paul did turn the world upside down, didn't he? He turned their rotten pagan culture upside down, preaching the message of Jesus Christ, the message of salvation, the message of a coming kingdom of God, something they had never heard. And I believe that he did turn it upside down. And, the, and down in verse 10, and, and, the, and the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night unto Berea, and coming thither they went into the synagogue of the Jews. And there was, no, there was more noble than the Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness of mind, and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. Therefore many of them believed, also honorable women, which were of Greek and of men, not a few, but when the Jews of Thessalonica had knowledge that the word of God was preached of Paul at Berea, they came thither also and stirred up, a, up the people. And then immediately the brethren sent away Paul to go, to go as it were to the sea, but Silas and Timothy abode there still. And of course we know that Paul went on there. He left there. He went to Athens where he had his famous sermon on Mars Hill there where he preached among all of these you know nobles and these educated men about this God whom he worshipped. And skipping ahead uh, down to um, chapter 18 and verse 4, Paul finally comes to Corinth and to Ephesus. This is the story where he comes to, um, to, F, uh, to Corinth, I should say, down to verse 18. Yeah, verse 18, chapter 18, verse 4. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and pers persuaded the Jews and the Greeks. And when Silas and Timothy were come from Macedonia, Paul was pressed in the spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus was Christ. Skipping down in verse 11. And he continued there a year and six months teaching the word of God among them. As I said, you read through these scriptures and you don't realize that time is going by. Paul spent a year and a half here teaching these people about the Word of God, meticulously going through God's commandments and laws and His statutes, going through what he experienced, and no doubt the teaching that he received while he was uh, in the desert place with Jesus and heard directly from Jesus the instructions that he had given. Um, and he, as I said, he stayed there a year and a half. And uh, 
eventually went through Ephesus as he as the rest of this chapter here says down in verse 19 I'll skip ahead I would love to read all this but I don't have time but I want to just hit some of these highlights he came to Ephesus and left them there but he himself entered the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews down in verse 20 and when they desired him to tarry longer a time with them he consented not but bowed them farewell saying I must must by all means keep this feast that comes to Jerusalem at Jerusalem here the apostle Paul was desiring to be back in Jerusalem in time for one of the feast days that they had kept and were still keeping here now almost 46 AD of course begins here or uh, and around 50 AD 50 to 53 AD uh, many of the commentators believe down in verse 23 uh, his third missionary journey and uh, this time, Paul did not sail across the Mediterranean Sea. He took the land route, which goes around the north side uh, of the, the, the Mediterranean Sea, and went to those same cities. I'm, I'm pretty sure Iconium, Lystra, and Derby. But he found himself in Ephesus, and I'd like to go there, Exodus, I mean, uh, Acts, I should say, the 19th chapter, verse 1. And he came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus and finding certain disciples. And he said unto them, Have you received the Holy Spirit since you believed? And they said unto him, We have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Spirit. And he said unto them, uh, He said unto them, Unto what then were you baptized? And they said, Unto John's baptism. These were some of the fruits of that John the Baptist had preached. Some of those people that heard John the Baptist teaching and preaching there by the Jordan River probably were ordained as elders and went back to some of these cities and started a a group there and were were baptized. And then Paul said, John verily baptized you with the baptism of repentance, saying to the people that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they spake with tongues and prophesied, and all the men were about twelve. And when they went into the synagogue and spake boldly for the space of three months, disputing and persuading the things concerning the kingdom of God. But when when divers were hardened and believed not, but spake evil of that way, being before the multitude, he departed from them and separated the disciples, disputing daily in the school of one Tyrannus. And this, this continued by this space of two years. And that's why I picked these scriptures here. You see, three years, a year and a half, three months. Here's another. By the space of two years, so that all that dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. I mean, when along the way would you have given up? You think about this is a man who was called of God. Now for many years now, he's been making these trips across this Asia Minor here and all of these different cities, spending a great deal of time with these men and women and preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. Look down in verse 20. Down in verse 20 of that same chapter. So mightily grew the word of God and prevailed. After these things were ended, Paul purposed in his spirit when he had passed through Macedonia and Achaia to go to Jerusalem, saying, after I have been there, I must also see Rome. So he sent unto Macedonia two of them that ministered unto him, Timothy and Erastus. But he himself stayed in Asia for a season, and that could be uh, rendered a year or a time, and the same time that arose no small stir about that way. Paul spent some time here in Asia, and he knew that he was going to go back to Jerusalem. They warned him not to go back, and uh, we know that he insisted that he have that he would go back to Jerusalem. In Acts the twentieth chapter, um, he went through Greece. He went to Corinth. He went through. Uh, um, Several of the churches there. I want to skip down to um, 
verse 6, chapter 20, verse 6, and, and we sailed away from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread and came unto them in Troas in five days, where we abode seven days. And upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them, ready to depart on the morrow, and continued his speech until midnight. This was a Saturday afternoon. Paul had probably been there for the Sabbath day service, and his stories, his preaching went on to into the afternoon hours and even into the night hours past midnight where a man up in the third law fell, fell asleep of all of his stories. He finally got tired and said, man, when is this guy going to shut up? He fell asleep and fell down and was dead. And it says Paul went down and healed the man and raised him from the dead. What an amazing story. Paul wanted to get it all in. He wanted to tell them all the things that he had to say, all of his journeys, the people that were being converted, the work that was growing, the people that were receiving the testimony of Jesus Christ. And up on the end of that meeting there, he had to leave. And he, was, he knew that he was never going to come to Ephesus again. He even told them, you won't see my face again. And it was a sad moment for them because they loved Paul, and Paul loved these people. He had spent a great deal of time with them. I'd like to read to you here what he says here in Acts, the 20th chapter. Down in verse 17, he says, or verse 16, Paul had determined to sail by Ephesus because he would not spend the time in Asia, for he had hasted if it were possible for him to be at Jerusalem by the day of Pentecost. And from Miletus he sent, Ephes sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church. And when they had come to him, he said, You know, and I want you to listen to what Paul says about his work and what he had done for this church. You know from the first day that I came into Asia after what manner I'd been with you at all seasons. Every season he had been with them. Serving the Lord with all humility of mind. And with many tears and temptations which befell me by the lying in wait of the Jews, and how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but have showed you and have taught you publicly and from house to house. He went right to their very homes. When they had questions and they had concerns and they had problems, he dealt with them all. Testifying both to the Jews and also the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. And now, behold, I go bound in the Spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things which shall befall me there, save that the Holy Spirit witness in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide with me. But none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy in the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. And now, behold, I know that you all, among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God, shall see my face no more. Wherefore, I take you to record, to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men, for I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Spirit has made you overseer to feed the church of God. He was telling some of those young ministers there, people like Barnabas and Timothy and some of those others, to care for the church of God, to take serious thought about their care because there were going to be those that he says down in the next verse, shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after themselves. I've seen that happen in the church of God myself. Therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years I cease not to warn you, warn every one of you night and day with tears. And now, brethren, I commend you to God. And to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. I have coveted no man's silver or gold or apparel. Yea, you yourselves know that these hands have ministered, and he must have held his own hands up and said, These hands have ministered unto my necessities and to them that are with me. 
I have showed you all things, how that soul laboring you ought to support the weak. And to remember the words of the Lord Jesus who said, It is more blessed to give than to receive. And when he had thus spoken, he kneeled down and prayed with them all. And they all wept sore and fell on Paul's neck and kissed him, sorrowing most of all for the words which he spake, that they should see his face no more. And they accompanied him to the ship. A sad story. A sad speech. It one that brings tears to my eyes when I read it. To think this is the last time they were going to see his face. Paul in 1 Corinthians 11 chapter said, Be you followers of me even as I am also of Christ. On one occasion Paul said, I labored more abundantly than they all. When he was speaking of all the apostles who had seen Jesus Christ. The work that he had done afterward was a monumental work. When you look at the evidence that we have here on our laps of 14 books that were inspired to be included in the canon of the scriptures, I say Paul's work was enormous. But I can also say this, that not very long will a man's work be forgotten. But the conversion that happens within the heart of a man will be remembered forever. And I think that was Paul's goal. He didn't want to be remembered for all that he did. He wanted those people to repent and to be converted and to be a part of God's family. He said later, I have fought the good fight. I have finished my course. Looking at the zeal of the Apostle Paul gives me a great deal of motivation to continue an extremely important work and a calling, one of which we all should carry or try to carry the level of zeal that strives to even approach unto that that the Apostle Paul had and men like Barnabas and Timothy and Apollos and Peter and James and John and those also who down through history since that time have carried this torch. May we all stir up the fire within each of us to complete the work of God.